So it's so nice to see the lecture hall filled again. Uh, I'm so happy you've, you're, you've all joined us again. This is just, this is our second lecture series, or lecture of the series. Um, uh, the series is called From the Field. And it's just such a wonderful way to kick it off, seeing so many faces. And uh, um, so thank you for being here. So as I said, I welcome you to our second lecture. Um, this is a 2023 Ariscraft Canada Brick Speaker Series. It's called From the Field. But I first want to start um, with uh, land acknowledgement. We are located on the traditional lands of the Neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university where we gather today is situated, situated on the Haldeman Track, the land granted to the Mohawk of the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River since 1794. The Six Nations people came here in exile from their traditional lands in New York State and are currently our neighbors on the site. And I thank Bill Woodworth, uh, who I, whose words I have in part echoed tonight in preparing this land acknowledgement. Um, the conference series, as I said, is called uh, From the Field. And so the series and all of the lecturers explore this idea of the field, uh, and also the idea of working in and from the field. Field work is unique uh, in that it requires hands-on processes that are entangled in the spatial, material, and cultural matters of place, people, and site. When we anchor spatial research and design as field work, we close the gap between speculative design and the practice of everyday life. So our title, From the Field, reflects this feedback loop that occurs when we stop to consider how local conditions, stakeholders, and agents play a meaningful role in shaping our design and studio practices. The speakers of this year's lecture series are all operating in different ways uh, in and from the field. I'd like to thank the planning committee, uh, Lola Shepard, Jalia Fonseca, Fiona Lim Tung, and Anwar Jabber. And also thank you to Eva Sabourin for uh, designing the poster, and of course to Ariscraft uh, Canada, Canadian Brick for funding this lecture series. Uh, I'm going to bring up Juliet Cook uh, to uh, introduce uh, Kelly Alvarez Doran, but first uh, a word about Juliet. To my other screen. <laughs> uh, Juliet is an intern architect, a lecturer, a researcher, and a new mother. She brings a life cycle lens to design thinking across a diverse portfolio of projects, evaluating those from the perspectives of embodied carbon, operational performance, cost, reuse potential, toxicity, labor, and more. She feels strongly that a return to a deeper understanding of materials, the ways they are made, and the ways in which they go together will enable a more regenerative design. Juliet is co-founder co at Half Climate Design, where she currently leads a collaborative project through the Circular Opportunity Innovation Launchpad. And this will showcase the economic viability and environmental necessity of deconstruction and material reuse across Ontario. Juliet's background in geography and environmental science has informed her knowledge and interest across various scales, from urban planning down to landscape design. In rediscovering the wonders of the world through the eyes of her young son, congratulations, Juliet. She has a deep commitment to design and policy work that will shape a healthier future for people and planet. Uh, Juliet, uh, some of you know that Juliet is also uh, an instructor here at the school this term and last term. Uh, so we welcome you up to the podium, <laughs> Juliet. Thanks, Tara. I had the pleasure of having Tara for two courses in my master's at Daniels. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly, a friend and my business partner. Uh, Kelly is a father, architect, educator, and activist. His holistic approach to the design of the built environment has been shaped by his experiences working across the world, first in the resource development sector and at Mass Design Group's East African office, where he led the design and implementation of several of Mass's projects, notably the award-winning Munini District Hospital and the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Working in these contexts brought about a profound sense of a building's provenance and the scales of social and environmental impacts 
inherent to the built environment. In 2020, Kelly established the Half Research Studio at the University of Toronto to catalyze a conversation around the embodied carbon and life cycle impacts of buildings in Canada. The graduate level studio has engaged over 20 leading offices, trained 34 students, I am one of those students, and has published internationally acclaimed research demonstrating how and where a building's upfront impacts reside. The studio's research underpinned the embodied carbon policies co-authored by Kelly that were recently adopted by the City of Toronto. And with that said, I'd like to welcome Kelly to the podium. Thank you. Uh, and good to be back. Good to be back at Waterloo. Um, I taught here 13 years ago, I want to say. Maya, Lola, myself, Rick used to do schlep back and forth to Toronto every morning. Um, so, yeah, so here's my, my talk today is obviously not to, to me, so I'm going to start off with a kind of famous conversation uh, you might have heard of uh, between uh, Buckminster Fuller and Norman Foster in 1978. Uh, Norman invites uh, Bucky to come and see his recent project in Norwich, the Sainsbury Center, um, to kind of show it off. And, and Bucky asked this question of Norman, which, I, which I'm not totally sure Norman totally understood the meaning of the question, how much does your building weigh, Mr. Foster? Um, a couple months ago, a friend, Sal Craig, went to the Foster Foundation in Madrid and took this photo um, of, of the response to that question, which to me has some pretty significant meanings. The first, it was written three weeks after I was born. Um, and the second, I think what it illustrates is over the 45 years that I've occupied this planet, a uh, pretty good representation of architecture's understanding of its impact. So, you know, here it is, dear Bucky, I thought you might like to see the enclosed drawing, which I promised when we were at the Sainsbury Center. It shows more clearly my description that the gasket is not penetrating the bolt, which is, a, which is kind, of, kind of thinking about air tightness every time I read that sentence. But he also asked about the weight and volume of the building, which are as follows. The weight, the ground slab, 4,507 tons of concrete. Structural steel, 256 tons. Aluminum panels, 80 tons. Aluminum subframe, 23 tons. Mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, dot, 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 dot. Aluminum, aluminum louvers, aluminum subframe. My building weighs 5,618 tons. Now, the problem is Norman's math is completely flawed. It, it has forgot about the externalities, that for every ton of aluminum at the project at the Sainsbury Center, here you can see the, the panels uh, mock-up, there's four to five tons of residual bauxite um, uh, mine waste in the countries where we currently get aluminum. So on the left, this is where Canada currently imports its uh, aluminum bauxite ore for processing. You can see the majority of Canadian aluminum is sourced in Guinea and West Africa. And that you can't understand the Sainsbury Center or any building, for that matter, without also understanding you know, the Tailings Pond at an aluminum refinery here on the banks of the Amazon. Um, that is the same building. That is the weight of that project. This is the weight of architecture. I have come to this understanding kind of full circle. Um, shortly after teaching here together, I took a job uh, that had me traveling around the world working on Canadian-owned mine sites for the better part of three years. Um, in this case, this is a zinc and copper mine in Zambia owned by uh, a Canadian company based in Toronto. And I worked with these gentlemen to envision a housing uh, development uh, for, for them and their families on the side of the mine. I worked with the province of Alberta for a good year, uh, developing a plan for a, an area the size of the Netherlands, thinking about where highways and hospitals ought to go to support the population required to expedite the extraction of this resource, something I look back at not as fondly these days. And I spent about a year in Panama uh, working with this indigenous community, uh, envisioning uh, a community that they would be resettled uh, into and, and, and co-designing it with them, ultimately to make way for what is Latin America's largest copper mine. So in all these cases, these are metals that ultimately largely filled uh, meet construction sector demands. At the same time, uh, to be a registered architect in Ontario, you need certain percentage of your hours in province. It's really hard to get registered when you're in Mongolia. Um, and so I had my first commission too. I convinced my now wife's parents, my in-laws, to, to, uh, to you know, commission me to design this cottage up near uh, Halliburton. And 
over the, while I was overseas, you know, flying back and forth every once in a while to get my CA hours. So you can see here this wood frame cottage in the middle of the forest just south of Algonquin, my father-in-law admiring, admiring our solar panel array. It's completely off-grid. And here, here's that cottage complete in 2014. Um, and at that point, I could call myself an architect. I wrote my x -Ax, and I was it. I'd done it. I'm an architect now. Um, let's move on. Got it published in Dwell, too. Uh, drove up one day with Alex uh, Bazikovich, who's the, now the, the critic of uh, the Globe and Mail. And he's parodying what I told him about the design here. So, you know, this cottage is highly sustainable. That the tightly insulated structure drawing its energy from a nearby bank of the solar panels you've seen, the water supplied from the lake. And, you know, I, I'm doing everything in the same as I was taught. It's, you know, thinking about solar uh, aspect, you know, that, that stove can heat the whole house. It's cross-ventilated, it should come sometime. Uh, it's a lovely place, but it's not sustainable. Um, I felt so much, so good about it, we actually got married there too in, in 2014, as you can see here, designed a deck large enough to hold our whole family. Shortly after, I took a job after um, uh, meeting some folks in Boston, uh, whilst Jane and I were both there at the same time, found myself in Rwanda not soon after with Mass Design Group, uh, designing this building, I'm a hospital, Manini Hospital. I'd never designed a hospital before. Really had no idea what I was embarking upon, but it was an incredible learning experience to think about patient and doctor flows and, and cross ventilation and a part of the world that has no power, just like my lake. Like how could you begin to do you know, first principles of design thinking again here? But um, you know, this, this exercise to me, the, the hospital, the government was interested in a kind of like a cut and paste approach. We, like, we've got 29 districts that need these. Can you develop a a prototype we can kind of drop around the country, but instead we have, let's develop the DNA of a hospital, something that can be flexible to each site. Um, but this project, aside from being a kind of totally new experience typologically, to me it was a, a, a eye-opening from a unlearning everything I thought I knew to be an architect. So on the left, this is the first visit to the site that I had where we're looking at the core samples of the soil so we could figure out what kind of bricks we may make on site, what kind of compressed earth blocks, but on the right, this is my colleague Annie and beaming smile for a door and window mock-up. And so this, this mock-up came after a lot of back and forth with our, our construction uh, ad, uh, advisor, Bruce Nazé, who, um, when, I, when first drawing these rectangles, drew them in big like my cottage, you know, just like window, door, you know, make good. Um, he said to me, Kelly, what are you doing? Like, what have you... We're not going to be able to afford things that big. Like, what do you mean, Bruce? Well, you know, that's going to require tempered glass the size that you're drawing that rectangle, much like the tempered glass in my cottage. So it's going to come from abroad, likely Dubai at best, and then it's going to require steel aluminum sections. Those are going to come from India. It's going to get to Mombasa, maybe put into a frame in Nairobi. Then it's going to drive all the way through Uganda to Rwanda. Rwanda has an 18% import tax on everything, so that's going to drive up the cost of construction. And finally, he said, You've driven on that road to Munini before. How much of that glass do you think will break along the way? Ah, great, great point, Bruce. I hadn't really thought about that. What do you suggest? Well, let's use smaller pieces. Let's use pieces we can get that are floated in Nairobi that don't need to be tempered. We'll drive them all the way to the job site. We'll use locally sourced recycled steel to reduce cost because then we don't have to import it. And, and by trucking the glass there, if there's any breakage, it's not going to slow down construction, right? And it was the first time I actually drew a window and not just a dumb rectangle sourced out of a catalog, but actually understood what a window was and how it operated, how it would be put together. And so you can see here the windows being welded together in the very room they're being hung. So a complete, you know, it was the first time that not hadn't thought about this rectangle has a whole trail of supply chain and decision making behind it, right? The second great lesson early on in the unlearning of, of, of the, say, the miseducation I had as a Canadian architect was this, this, this school in the middle of Congo, most difficult place to get to I've ever been, and that's much harder than going to Tuk Tuk Tuk. So to get to Alima, you, you take a barge up the river from Kinshasa for about four days, and you get to the landing, and then you're on the back of a dirt bike for four hours, cross a path that's as wide as your shoulders in places, and crosses bridges on the right like this about half a dozen times. So an incredible set of design constraints to think about how to build a project. So you have to really think what's here, who's here, and how can we build the school. And so on the left, you can see ultimately what the school looked like. 
And the weight of this school, unlike the Sainsbury Center, completely came from the site. You can see here, 99% of its weight, it's worse than 10 kilometers of the site, made out of earth, made out of wood, uh, made out of uh, uh, you know, soils that we found. So here, um, this part of Africa, if you've ever been there, termite mounds, you can see these massive old termite mounds, and, and the saliva of termites actually has a cementitious property, so that we use that for sun-dried bricks that made up all the walling. Um, for the shingles, instead of the kind of ubiquitous galvanized corrugated sheet metal roofs that rust out and have about a 10 to 15 year lifespan, you know, instead we found a species of tree that had very similar uh, properties to that of cedar. So you could throw shingles, you can begin to see already the evidence here of maintenance and repair. So ultimately, we're leaving a school to this remote community. They need to be able to look after it, right? Um, Mass probably, I think we're known as a, as a social impact firm, and so here we're always really thinking about where the cost of construction is going, like whose pockets it can get into. So you can see here 83% of the project's cost directly into on-site labor. But this was the first time that I'd ever heard the word embodied carbon, and it, those two words together. Um, and I was working with researchers at MIT, this is about seven years ago now. And for me, this was just the jaw-dropping moment of my career of, holy shit, 1 28th of a, rate of, an, of a global school. And I began to think, you know, what was the impact of the school I went to in Winnipeg? You know, that's a global average. I must have been much higher. And, and this phenomenal low school that we had, the kind of the lessons of Alima really stuck with me. So at the same time, it's like, well, what have I done? What, what does this mean in the context of North America? So I went back and I looked at this cottage I, you know, I was so proud about. Um, what was its embodied carbon? So I went back and developed, you know, kind of the rhino model of, of, my, of my project to develop the, the volumes and the takeoffs, and then I put it through um, the life cycle software that Juliet and I use every day uh, to understand that this cottage, its structure and its skin alone represented 92 tons of CO2. And to put that into context, that's, that's me driving a car in Canada for 92 years. So that for a summer home, um, but of it, only 10% was wood. I thought it was a wood frame cottage, it's not. It's a foundation with a wood frame on top of it. So at some point, I did this cast concrete crawl space. There's nothing down there, but that's what I thought foundations were, right? And then, um, so this alone is 60 tons here, the concrete and this nasty pink stuff that wraps it. Over half of it was made out of petroleum. The, the XPS being 44% of it, and the ubiquitous asphalt roofing that you see across North America, the other 13%. And that over half of this cottage was from oil. Really, really stuck with me. And I, why did I do this? And there's a version of this presentation where I have like my comprehensive studio project that's got pink XPS all through its wall sections that I got an A plus for. Um, but I think I'll just blame the government today. The, you know, of a 77 things in a Canadian house. This is a live document. If you go to do your own house, you'd refer to this. 77 things in a Canadian house and 11 of them are made out of oil, minimum, 11. And think about that for a second. Like this is the state of contemporary Canadian construction and education. Um, uh, our, our, our business partner, Ryan, was a student. We had, you know, I asked the students, okay, let's look at the history of materials. Uh, in the context of Toronto. Like, how did we get to this point here? And so as you can see, certainly references here, my friends, to previous work, <laughs> Jane and, and Maya. But the history of insulation is fascinating because what you basically see chronologically in reverse order is that we moved into plastics. We are in the age of petrochemicals here from about the 50s onwards, right? But not 100 years ago, we were using the things now that we think are boutique you know, the, the vegetable fibers, the animal fibers, the cellulose. And things like cellulose that were so pervasive were a province covered in forestry at that point. It's a byproduct of forestry. This was a kind of default. And then through regulation and lobbying became less and less available at the same time that this stuff and its availability increased dramatically. And here, this is a letter written in 2020 by Senator Barrasso, if you know this gentleman, to the, X, this is from the XPS Association of America, basically asking the EPA saying, we know we already have a better kind of way to make this. In Canada, it's already required, it's NGX, if you've ever heard of it. It's less bad, it's still not good. In Europe, we stopped doing this a decade ago, but please keep letting us make XPS 
the cheapest possible way. Okay, that's and, and they did, of course. This was still under Trump at that point. Um, two ways to think about these two materials. So if you go to Google right now and Google, tell me about cellulose and XPS. Well, what's really interesting is on the left, like there's a really negative tone to, X, to cellulose, which is nuts. And then on the right, quite the opposite. Why is XPS the best? Well, because they spent a ton of money convincing us that it is. Um, here's one cost and carbon comparison that we did recently, looking at the trade-off of these things. So we're like, well, that material is also cheaper. No, it's actually not. It's more expensive. Uh, and from a carbon perspective, you can see if you're left of that line, you're arguably, you know, in, you're helping the climate versus being on the right of the line. Um, our friends at KPMB a couple years ago, Jeff Turnbull put out this report. It was up online on Canadian Architect for two hours um, before it was taken down. This is the first of a few graphs today. This is whole life carbon. So what you see here on the left is that's the embodied carbon of the material itself, okay? So the further down it is, the higher the embodied carbon. Then as time moves to the right, this basically is saying what, at what point in time does the, having the insulation on the building and the energy it's saving from gas heating, at what point in time does that cross over with the upfront emissions of the insulation? So most products here, cellulose, fiberglass bats, they cross over in the first hour or day, right? Uh, the stuff I put on the foundation of a summer home that we occupy for like, you know, maybe a month, a year, it crossed over in year nine. If it was gas heated, which it's not. But if you're doing the right thing right now, if you're using electrical heat and cooling in your house, this is the year that that insulation crosses over. I.e., you're better off not having insulation. You're better off having paper on your house from an atmospheric perspective. It was on Canadian Architect for an hour. It was taken off. It got posted up a year later with the sponsor's names taken off of the graph. And that's, that's up there now. And if you go to look for this report, there's an advertisement by Owens Corning right next to it. The other way to look at my cottage is that is the question of where it came from. So here it is. Uh, it came from all over the world. Canadian architecture is rapacious. You can see much of it came from China, from a kind of lighting and electronics. The stove, which we, we covet, this is Danish stove, it's fantastic. There, this Portuguese stone for this coffee table here. Our flooring produ produced in Austria, but ultimately sourced from uh, Poland. Uh, and the windows, something I took great pride in. I'm from Manitoba, I wanted low end windows, they're Douglas fir, um, gonna, gonna support my, my provincial industry. And in that, I, I got a friend from my undergrad who works for Lowen, and I asked him, John, where'd the windows come from? He's like, well, I'll look into it, I'll get back to you. We'll talk, to our, talk to our guys and figure out the supply chain. So here it is, this is the Lowen window. The tempered glass, the big pieces of glass are floated in Missouri. Or sorry, the floated in Missouri, tempered in Collingwood, and then they're trucked over to Steinbach, Manitoba, put into a frame, and they truck right back past Collingwood to our job site. The wood either comes from British Columbia or Oregon. And you can see then the gases, spacers come from Southeast Asia and the hardware is coming from Germany. But then, you know, who knows where the metals are actually coming from. So this is one window and this is one component in this cottage. So I see this cottage very differently now. I see it, I see it as a father and I see it as the set of mistakes I've made and frankly how I was trained to practice. Um, and I, and it, I, <laughs> I can't look at it now. The, the, that damn roof, like, um, you know, what was I thinking? And I see it also for where we are. And if you haven't seen this before, the life I've lived, the change I've seen, you know, born, as you know, in 1978. So the more the two children I have, they're born right around 2020, and the life and the future that we're going within, and how we cannot continue to make these mistakes. We can't be sourcing XPS and asphalt shingles for our buildings. And so if you're familiar with the IPCC's requirements of how are we going to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, there's a simple polemic. We need the half emissions the decade we're in. So we started the half studio in 2020. These 10 years, we have to half those emissions. If we're three years in, it's not going well. Um, and then critically, what's half of what, right? So this is global emissions. If you've never seen this wheel before, so buildings are 40% of the problem, right? 28% is the emissions, the heating, the cooling, the live load of the buildings we have, and the 11% is new construction every year. 
And so, you know, my education was kind of all about limiting this, but paid no attention to that at all. In a city like Toronto, this is 60 to 70% of the equation. And so if you're an architect right now, you pick the right profession because you're gonna have way more impact on the potential of climate change mitigation than any other discipline, say maybe structural engineering, because we can actually do something about that. All right, my education 15 years ago, that's what we were taught. That was all the sustainability with that little box. And this is what I teach. All the other stuff, you have to see it together. So when you hear embodied carbon, it's bounded by the green line, that's the materials from cradle to gate, through use, through repair, to ultimately where it, where it you know, might get landfilled, probably shouldn't. Operational piece in that as whole life carbon. So if you hear whole life carbon, it's the building's entire life, all of it together considered in one view. Okay, so the first project, you know, with this newfound enlightenment the, that had the opportunity to lead this project, Howard, Howard Buffett uh, came, came to us and won this competition, said, okay, Kelly, you're $60 million, can make me a university. Um, and you got a, you got a nice big site, um, see what you can do. Fantastic opportunity to really push things. So from the landscape side, it was a former uh, Belgian agricultural research facility. We're really interested in how to get regenerative, it's conservation agriculture. It's not monocultural industrial agriculture. So it's about doing like multi-crop uh, agroforestry. So it's a very regenerative approach to the overall landscape. And you can see here, we wanted to weave the, 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 the forest at the top to the papyrus in the bottom and through as much biodiversity as possible uh, intertwined with the buildings. This is the enterprises where they learn um, how, to, how to be farmers. So here's one of those buildings, early days. Begin to see its kind of material palette, some concrete in the base uh, there you'll see, but mostly of earth and of clay. Um, we worked with Transolar, Krista, who's a proud Canadian from Toronto, with, uh, looking at how to limit uh, your, our energy use as much as possible. So this is, you know, classrooms that could be daylit, could be cool, do not need lighting, do not need mechanical uh, ventilation whatsoever. And this, uh, this is kind of our correspondence with, with her at the point. This, if you could reduce your energy consumption as much as possible, the campus is fully off grid. Ergo, your solar power array is also gonna be as small as it can be, right? So this is a day in the life of the university that kind of, you can see kids waking up in the morning in a big direct hot water. That's like everybody having a shower in the morning and then various programs throughout the day. Here's a view of the campus center. So that's the cafeteria on the left and walking down to that space here, library on the right, admin um, on the left, and you just begin to see the rammed earth, the wood, the kind of material set that we had. So at the beginning, we, you know, we had a, hired a bunch of engineers, uh, for both from Rwanda and the UK to release, to help us design this, and you know, basically said, okay guys, it's, it's, we're going as low as we go. How do we, how do we reduce embodied carbon as much as we can on this project. And it's about limiting cement and steel, basically. So here is the material pallet, coffee husk fired ceramic roof tiles, brought the wood frame over from Canada on this one, uh, non-fired uh, walling and rammed earth, and then finally the thing, you know, these stone foundations. I was in conversation with a few of you today and just walking around Galt today. Lots of really nice stone foundations. This building, I suspect, is mostly founded on stone. Um, our engineers, uh, incredible team of this is, uh, Amable and Harriet digging holes across the site to basically find the right mix, the right compressed earth block. I've had a few conversations today. Again, go take the bus and, and uh, ram some earth, folks. Uh, we visited mills across Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania to find sources. And there's no like FSC certified wood in this part of the world. And they come in different dimensions and different species. So we, Instead of us saying, hey, can you give us two by sixes, what do you have? How do we design around the kind of species, the dimensions, and lengths that you provide? Um, when it came to the site, we, our engineering team tested the pieces that would come off, and if they failed, we'd find them a use as well. Like they could be a kind of non-structural use in the project. So, you know, our focus on labor here, 98% of this project's sourced within 100 miles. Um, and, you know, working with cooperatives, so we had the opportunity to design all the furniture and all the lighting. It's very, very much the kind of complete project here. So here you can see the lighting fixture being uh, woven by a, a sisal cooperative, sisal weaving cooperative. We formed a woodworking atelier to make all the desks and the chairs. Uh, we worked with these banana weavers here to make the couch backs out of agricultural byproduct, kind of consistent, clear with the, 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 the theme of the campus. 
This results in like 96% of this project's material being sourced in Rwanda. Rwanda is the size of Connecticut for scale. So it's like, it's a pretty good feat. That's, and there's, you know, very kind of from a resource perspective, like not a lot of metals or anything too. So really focusing on, on uh, natural materials was, was key. To do the carbon accounting, we practice this EPDs, if you've ever heard this acronym, Environmental Product Declaration. So that's what you use to kind of do the accounting. And you can see we work in a part of the world that doesn't have many of them, if, if any. So we made the first EPD in country working with the, this is the ceramics factory that did the roof tile. So like from quarry to kiln, what's your whole process and what are the energy inputs along the way to, to arrive at the first EPD in the country? And ultimately that fed into our kind of accounting. So here is Rika on the right and the kind of straw man business as usual version of the same project on the left. And, and so the big difference is where stone footings versus concrete footings, big difference right there, and wood frame versus steel frame and a few others. But as good as we could do, we had about 58% reduction, right? You can't get to zero, but that's like, that's as hard as we could push. Now, when you add this all up then at the scale of a campus, we worked with Atelier 10 and Arab to run the numbers also on all the infrastructure, the roads, the cables, the pipe, the solar array. Interesting, the solar array is embodied carbon. It takes 15 years of generation to offset the battery pack, and the battery pack has a 16-year warranty. Um, and the landscape. And so that's the kind of total footprint. So doing everything we can to reduce that, we then had a, a developed a plan uh, to then a forest 40 hectares on the site. So Hypothetically, in a decade, this could be the world's first actual climate positive campus because we have the luxury of that much space and we did the effort of reducing the kind of the deficit at the beginning. Now, it's gotten some recognition it's on the front cover of the built environment report from Reba, which felt like a big deal. But for me, like the, the, the pinnacle of my professional career is getting stone foundations onto the cover of a structural engineering magazine. Um, and also, all this work in not just this project, but a decade of practice in Rwanda using earth construction, we co-developed here a building code with the government of Rwanda for earth construction and seismic areas, giving dignity and kind of legality back to a form of construction that's been there for thousands of years. So um, I think of, of all the work that we've done, this is arguably the most impactful thing, uh, policy. So this is generally the time of the lecture that somebody's thinking, Great, you can do that in a place like Rwanda. How the hell do you do it in Galt? Well, um, we have to. Here's a, uh, per, this is an overview of per capita emissions. We are the worst. Canada is the highest emitting country in the G20 nations, only outdone by our friends in the Gulf states that are in a desert and completely dependent on fossil fuels. Um, so that's a, that's a good place to start from because it should be a lot easier for us to reduce our carbon footprint than you know, my colleagues down in Rwanda. Much easier, you would think so. Also, we need to, for our own sake, I've been in Worcester the last couple days at a conference and uh, Ellen Pond spoke to, she works for uh, the Climate Center, uh, sorry, Canadian Center for Climate Services, a projected warming in Canada here. So what's interesting, I didn't quite appreciate this this week, is that if global warming's kept to 1.5 degrees, that's a, glo that's a global average. Canada, that's three to four times hotter than that. So 1.5 degree actually translates to 4.5 to, 4 to 6 degrees in Canada. We are the country moving, uh, heating up the fastest, and that's happening the fastest in the north. So it is in our national interest to act differently. So that's basically the question then I've been asking at, at Daniels the last couple of years. So how can we have the embodied carbon of construction in Canada this decade? I've been fortunate to teach a master's level student uh, studio for the last three years. This was uh, two years ago. Um, the first year uh, solicited 10 buildings from friends across Toronto. Wanted to look at multi-unit residential. It's because what, what we build the most of at different scales had to be in the ground or recently built to just to say, what are we doing right now so we can improve upon it? So you can see here a mixture of low rise towns, mid rise and tall buildings. The second year as a counterpoint to that, we looked at mass timber in Toronto, out west, two in Sweden and two in the UK. Is mass timber, you know, the hope, the great hope that I think a lot of people have for it? And then last year, the university asked us to look at their own buildings. Um, and so we looked at buildings built in the last 15 years, and this is the time that we also then got their 
actual operational data. So this is the embodied and this is the operational emissions of their building. So we're looking at whole life carbon now. The methodology is pretty simple, uh, something I'd love to see repeated at universities across the world. It's case studies. Kind of funny to me that in, when I went through school, we did like a little precedent study here and there. We didn't do deep case studies, where law and business school rely on case studies as a kind of fundamental component of their education. I'll throw that out there for you. Um, we take a building, we take a representative section of the building. It's a lot to chew through in a semester. So you take a piece of cake, it tells you what the whole cake tastes like, build a model of it, do a life cycle assessment, and now we've added the energy modeling component too, where we learn, uh, I co-teach with Alston Jakubiec, we use uh, uh, climate works to do it a kind of an energy model based on type and use, and then we compare that with the actual energy use of, of the university to again arrive at a whole life uh, carbon view. Um, through it, we've also not just engaging students, but engaging practice. This is the first time all the practices of that, we've, that we've engaged save one, the first time they've also looked at any of this. So it's been really effective to get uh, practitioners thinking about it. So here's Carol Phillips that teaches at U of T as well and Phil Silverstein from Moriyama Tashima, and this was working through the building. So this is also the first time for students that are looking at CDs and specs more often than not. So I asked them, give us, give us your CDs, give us your specs. I don't want your BIM model. I want them to kind of piece this together. It's a little, um, what's the woman from Homeland again? Carrie, Carrie Bradshaw, you know, kind of like re, kind of putting the pieces together here. Here's an overview of some of the findings. So multi-unit residential, uh, the mass timber, kind of comparable. Institution, roughly 2x. Institutions, this, I haven't fully done the summary uh, of all of it, but a few things that stuck out is that one, the University of Toronto heats its buildings in the dead of summer. On an August day on an empty campus, that central steam plant is heating buildings. Anybody have a guess why? Rick. Because air conditioning. Because the air conditioning is taking it down to eight degrees to drop humidity out, and they have to use heat to heat it back up. Empty buildings getting heated in the dead of August. That's the state of mechanical engineering. Bonkers. <clears throat> Brand new building. Faculty of engineering using three times more energy than modeled. Some litigation happening here right now. But just when, when I see this, what happens to me is all the assumptions we have about what high-performing buildings is, we're designing Lamborghinis and throwing the keys to somebody who's never driven a car. All right, what drives emissions across buildings? One, like my cottage, buildings are icebergs. Foundations, basement parking structures, below grade area have disproportionate impacts on embodied carbon. So, to illustrate this, this is a stack townhouse by Bate Zorba. This is the wood. So <clears throat> to explain these illustrations, on the left is the model of the building, and the middle is the model of the volume of the material. So these are like, you know, that's like two by fours in plywood, and that's the volume of the emissions of that material. So when you see a non-linear relationship like this yellow, it's got high embodied carbon. Here's insulation. There's my good friend XPS, the blue foam hugging the basement, off the charts. Here's concrete, I think concrete, a lot of people know, they're doing work to reduce the emissions of concrete. We just use less concrete. <clears throat> Here is the emissions of all the stick frame houses. And this is a stand-in for any light residential, like single family housing. It's all underground, from 90% to 71%. Why is this happening? Anybody? Why are we doing this? I'm looking at you, Rick. Okay. There's two fundamental reasons this happens in Canada and not where I live. One, how GFA is defined. In the Ontario Building Code and most building codes across North America, your any floor area below grade is not considered part of your coverage calculation. You can go as deep as you want in Canada. There's nothing regulating there from a coverage perspective. That's the first piece. The second piece is it's been cheap, right? So it's like, I want a bigger house, I'm allowed to, give me a big basement so I can put my laundry machine down there and shoot pucks against it. On the other end, mid-rise and tall buildings also have big foundations. So tall building, tall building goes between 50% and 8%. This one's down in the Don Valley, 
It's a floodplain. They could not go down. So it's above grade. That's Sasia Prat. This is in the junction. This is the LCBO in the junction, Maya. 50% of it's below grade. It's bathtub. It's built on an underground stream. And the reason this is happening is that historically there were parking minimums. And again, the floor area is not considered below grade. So I'm a developer. I need to provide parking. I'm going to put it below grade because it doesn't go against my coverage and I get as many units as I can. These perverse incentives that we have to create these massive icebergs. And then we add to it. So we looked at TCHC in greater detail. So not only we put parking below grade, we then do things as stupid as a meter deep thick concrete transfer beam, the entire ground floor, to mediate the fact that the grid of this and the grid of this are different. That your parking space and your kitchen are different dimensions. An additional 15%. And then we add another 15% on top of it for the fact that when you dig a hole, you have to shore it with shotcrete and shoring. Not the behavior of species interested in its survival. Second thing, use less metal. Aluminium extruded, <laughs> aluminum extrusion based glazing and facade systems, a polite way of saying curtain wall and window wall, carry the highest embodied carbon, uh, global warming potential volume of any material. So if you've seen this, it's from the Royal Danish Academy. This is the, the food pyramid of building materials from an embodied carbon perspective. This is controlled for Denmark, so Canada would be slightly different, but. At the bottom are your vegetables. Your, pl your, pl your, your vegetables are down here. That's all the woods and the cellulose and stuff. At the top are the metals. And at the very top is aluminum. Aluminum is the Wagyu beef of architecture, right? And we eat it for every meal. So these are three buildings in, at the University of Toronto, clad in aluminum and stainless steel framed with aluminum. We use metal. I mean, there's a reason I worked on a big hole in Africa for three years. It's to source this kind of stuff, right? Um, and here's a view of, of, a, of a building we're looking at with, um, with Kirkor right now, and the relative grid intensity of envelope. And like what you see is that the windows, window wall and curtain wall, have the highest grid intensity compared to the other systems by a factor of three to four. And why is all of this curtain wall happening along the ground floor? I'll come back to that. But just this is so typical of Toronto, four and a half meters of consistent curtain wall. So the first year we looked at what's the relationship between embodied carbon and thermal performance. Window wall, Toronto's gift to the world. Really abhorrent thermal performance, incredibly high embodied carbon. Compare that to, this was Juliet's project. This is Alex Park, Levitt Goodman, I think the architects of the school. This is a uh, rain screen brick, that's XPS, steel stud. You can see it's hitting the R value. The, the embodied carbon's not bad. Juliet's like, what if I swap the XPS for, for wood fiber board? Dang. Half of it's like on, and, and that's a kind of fictional wall section there, but just to show how easy it is. In the second year of mass timber, we saw way more innovation. So here is a kind of range. You can see this is material because it's biogenic or bio based, arguably sequestering carbon. So TRCA headquarters, new project by uh, Buckholtz McAvoy, arguably climate positive. It's using wood shingles in the exterior there. So a lot of things to be learned here. Also with facades. <clears throat> facades don't last as long as a building structure. They have you know, shorter life cycles. They're exposed to the elements. So you know, though the facade is a, a small percentage of the upfront emissions, it's the running concern. So we're working with Diamond Schmidt here for an institutional project in Brampton thinking, you have to think longer term here. It's not just about the upfront piece. How do we give this, this facade longevity and think, one, not, hey, in 15, 20 years, you're just going to take it off and throw it in the scrap heap like we currently do, but how do you design it differently so that when you need to service, it can easily come apart and it could be resurfaced or reglazed or reframed, right? Designed for disassembly. Third point, geography really, really matters. That the grid our materials are coming from is as important as the grid our building sits on from a whole life perspective. So to illustrate this back to the Bate Zorba, the brick stood off as like, what's going on here? Like that's a really high emitting brick. And when we interviewed uh, Andrew, they didn't want the kind of browns and uh, oranges that you get from Brampton Brick, the one big supplier here. So they went with shades of gray from Lincoln, Nebraska, and Pearl, Arkansas. And so you might think, hmm, that's a lot more travel time. That's what's driving it. No, that's like a fraction of the percentage. It has everything to do with this reality, that a piece of clay fired in Ontario is one-tenth as intense as a piece of clay 
fired in Arkansas because it's being fired on coal power and ours is being fired on a, on a cleaner power source here because up until recently, we invested in low emitting to non-emitting power sources here, right? Same with wood. So when we looked at, this is the catalyst building uh, by Michael Green Architects, and the wood came from very different places. If you know the history of Katerra at all, um, short-lived mass timber pro uh, company. But you can see it came from uh, different sources, three different sources here. And my student, Ophelia, did the LCA and said, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, Kelly. I've got this number that's almost twice of the carbon leadership form, which is the kind of who's who of this in, in North America out of the University of Washington. I don't think you're doing anything wrong, Ophelia. Go look at their report. So of the 207 kilograms a square meter, most of it was based on generics. So at this point, only five years ago, let's say basically one cubic meter of CLT for all of North America had the same number, which doesn't make sense per the last slide, and that that has changed since. And so there, the, the, the move from generic to specific is what accounted for the difference. So here is a, a view of where the wood came from for these various projects. The tall wood tower getting built in Toronto by Pat Count MGA. Found out it was getting sourced from wood cut at Fort McMurray, interestingly enough, which is nuts. You're thinking we're building we're building in Ontario, yet we're servicing wood up there, right? Um, and that the project in Washington, its, its sources were in Washington, BC, and Alberta. So very different. And you could see here, this, this point two years ago, that a cubic meter of CLT, really big difference where it's cut and dried. So there's no such thing as a Canadian forest. There's no such thing as Canadian forestry. It's very specific. Where a tree falls, how it's cut, how it's handled, where it's dried, really depends on the geography of that supply chain. All right, four. Take a whole life view. So operational and body together. Only by looking at these two things are we gonna really tackle the problem ahead of us. And to talk about this, here's two projects getting built in Canada right now. On the right, Toronto, Frank Gehry, and the left, Bjark Engels Group in Calgary. Same project, very different. So here is two buildings, the exact same embodied carbon in Toronto, it's like 20,000 in shade, 20,000 a bit over there. But the operations, Radically different if you're in Toronto versus Alberta because, again, the grid intensity. Alberta's grid intensity, t 10 times that. It's very pretty similar to Arkansas, right? So if you're practicing, you're going to graduate at the University of Waterloo, you're going to get a job you know, somewhere in province, what's the thing that you probably need to be taught to think about? Um, <clears throat> here is four facades. So Juliet and I looked at this with, with uh, Dr. Ted Kessick, wanted to ask this question, Four facades. So these are two CLT projects on the right, two housing. This is a KPMB window wall, and that's the TRCA housing with Leva Goodman. And here's four ways to understand the facade. So we controlled ratios, window to wall ratio, accounted for the whole project. Here's the embodied carbon, the gray, first thing you see, this is aluminum, the Wagyu beef. It's just completely frame and frame. The second color you see is peach, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, window frame. So the, the, so much of the embodied carbon is in the frame. And aside from it being high embodied carbon, PVC is incredibly, it's a carcinogenic, it's a, it's, it's a petroleum product, and it derailed in East Palestine this year, Ohio. So thinking about why that train derailed, it's between a refinery and a place to make either pipe or window frame. And this is the kind of energy efficient windows we have across North American housing. So here's how to look at a facade. This is their thermal performance married with the embodied carbon in a look. So here is, this is the window wall in every condo in Toronto. And that's an alternative version of cladding that same building. Very different. You can see two different footprints over time. And arguably, this is how we should be thinking about buildings. So over time, that's the emission. There's no such thing as a net zero building. Bullshit. Um, <clears throat> and that here is the kind of maintenance regime. So you know, 20, 30 years, you have to kind of change windows out. That's maintenance. Buildings emit. <clears throat> and so a kind of way to begin to look at this across the continent, we, for a conference in DC, so I wanted to add some American content to it. Six cities, different climates, different grids. Um, window wall, the worst performing thing. What year does window wall make sense to have that extra pane of glass? So right now, a lot of energy codes in British Columbia, Ontario, Massachusetts, going just really just myopically focus on reduce your energy demand, reduce electrical demand, right? Add more window, add more frame. That's the year the atmosphere thinks that's a good idea in Toronto versus a dirty grid, cold climate in Minneapolis or Calgary. That's, this is 
the direction of our energy codes right now. And this does not assume grid decarbonization. So Massachusetts, right now, they have a plan to decarbonize their grid by 2050. So this, this line actually plateaus. So this dot will migrate further and further right. And yet, that's what we're doing right now from a code perspective. OK, so moment of hope. Um, <clears throat> we can do this here. As mentioned, Juliet and I and the city of Toronto took this data from the University of Toronto, took it to Lisa King's desk and said, Lisa, what are we going to do about this? So we got a TAF grant together. We did a benchmarking study involving the entire industry, developers, architects, manufacturers, planners. And we, this policy report went out. Part of it, the city said, we design buildings. What would it mean for us to have caps? So we worked at Diamond Schmidt on this EMS station. Late stage, DD, you can see it's like a, it's, it's for their ambulance fleet. It's like a big, big garage. Um, <clears throat> Juliet did the LCA for it, and we found, okay, well, you got some hot spots, XPS as usual. This one's really interesting, paints and coatings. This is an epoxy coating on the big concrete floor, much like I assume this, no, this doesn't look like that. Um, <clears throat> good job on the specification here. Uh, so the coating on that floor uh, stood out, and so we came back with and said, hey, six things you can do in your spec, shave 30% reductions and we found they went off they found it cost negligible in one case sped up construction so we saved 800 tons of avoided emissions while well, Juliet did in two weeks of work so feel much better about my cottage um, that policy passed this spring and the same day the multiplexes went through this was a rider on it so now Toronto is the first city in North America with maximum targets for their own buildings that report in Diamond Schmidt went viral this is a screen grab of their internet um, and that was like basically a lot of the work we started doing and people were beginning to respond to it like, holy shit, what the, I had no idea. You could, this is easier than, than it looks. And on the back of this momentum, Julia and myself and Ryan basically like, okay, let's, for, let's start a business because we're getting people asking us to help them now. So we started half last spring on the back of this momentum. And basically half is this, this a question, like how do we do it right now this decade? And then how do we get there by 2050? And so I'm going to show you some of what we're doing right now. The first thing we set it up is you know, providing life cycle assessments, like the ones we just showed you, and balancing that. So we're working with, this is with CureCore, a big kind of execution architect. They do tons of square meters. This is a, a Regent Park Block 1 study here. That's where that elevation came from you saw earlier. Looking at things like, how do we deal with parking? Well, would they need parking right now? OK. What if you only put on half of the site? That would reduce your transfer beam situation, reduce uh, that, that'll reduce carbon. What if we put it above grade? Really controversial idea. Hotel I'm staying in does it not so gracefully. But um, that's also much better from a carbon perspective. And so here, again, beginning to think about how we can get reductions in projects uh, in Toronto. Um, the energy question, working, this is an office building in Victoria with Diamond Schmidt, asking that same question. Is that window system, is the extra pain from the BC step code a good idea? Evidently not. Um, working with the Bentway right now, looking at the landscape of the Bentway done by public work, but also at the infrastructure of the highway itself and its maintenance regime to understand, begin to think about the embodied carbon of landscape and, and infrastructure. Um, the second thing, I think, you know, the piece that really got us going is working with policymakers and industry leaders to reshape our codes and our planning frameworks. There's so much of the rules, we talked about this a little bit today, the rules of the game we're not thinking about this. We need to change them. And then we collaborate, educate, and advocate. We, we teach at the University of Waterloo, the University of Toronto. Um, so here's an overview. There's Juliet teaching a room full of architects at the, the Toronto Society of Architecture. Um, Ryan was speaking last week at a, at a conference. There's my studio, U of T, and there's me wearing the same jacket. Um, <clears throat> we are now working with the City of Toronto on their urban design guidelines. Lisa came back and said, well, you identified a lot of problems, let's look at them. So we're working now cross-departmentally on picking these apart and thinking about how can they change to help architects reduce the embodied carbon of their buildings. The first step was looking at this, the rear transition plane of the mid-rise guidelines. If anybody's worked on a mid-rise project, I'm sure you felt handcuffed the entire time. Um, <clears throat> so they wanted to look at what if we reduce it to one step back or, or no, what's the implication on embodied carbon? So we looked at two projects, one in the junction. This is out in Scarborough. And so you see the similar, the distribution of carbon in the building, parking, transfer slab, housing. Like we've got a housing shortage and yet we're building this. Doesn't make a lot of sense. 
And so we looked at how, if you change the mass as kind of counterfactuals, how does that affect it? And looking at it on a tons per bedroom per hectare, a ton per unit per hectare. So yes, simplifying the massing, and this just assumes they're still using reinforced concrete. Simplifying the building, getting to step backs will actually decrease and increase unit count. All right, and then finally, we provide things to get to the next step. So forget it, optimize, the future is reuse and it's bio-based materials. That's the future. So we provide deconstruction audits, material strategy to catalyze building retrofit, material reuse, and a return to bio-based materials. Um, so here's some of the work we've been doing. This is in London with local work studio, looking at this beautiful postmodern granite clad office building that's gonna get completely resurfaced. We're like, why don't we use the granite? Where'd the granite come from? Jane Hutton, ode to Jane here on the right. Um, and this was you know, my takeoff of like, here's all the granite, here's the size. You know, here's, you know, once you take, decontextualize it from its postmodernism, it's really nice. Um, what can we do with it? How do we take it apart? Where do you store it? Doesn't even need to leave the site. There's a whole bunch of empty office buildings all over London right now. We could take it apart, leave it in the parking lot, and actually use this as like a, a works facility, potentially too, bring saws to it. What do we do with the stone? Well, here's 14 ideas that you could do with the stone. We're like keeping it as it is, grinding it up, uh, reconstituting it, and here's a couple of them. So the first, large dimensions, take them as they are, reapply them, reorganize them, recompose them, right? It's a design question. Uh, Redimension them, cut them, make them all the same size, and here's some ideas that we had. Uh, and then beginning to compare them, so doing, you know, versions of the embodied carbon. The, the architects that commissioned the work, they wanted, initially they wanted to do a precast wall with stone slip facing, that's what that would be, 135 a square. And we're like, why well, just keep what the system that it is? It's like 1 12th the emissions if we just keep the system that's there. Working with the Mass Timber Institute and Intuitive and Bird, looking at questions of, you know, the, the move towards mass timber. This is a generic 12 story office building in Toronto. How do they fare? Evidently, fairly well. So, how do we move to wood, move, move back to wood building in Ontario? Um, and finally, we just, we're, we're, we just finished this with dialogue at Seneca College, deconstructing this building, it's about 40 years old, to make way for a new one, and thinking about what are the, what are the opportunities for reuse here at Seneca, and what are the opportunities also for bio-based materials. So, in conclusion, um, <clears throat> we need to do less of everything. Less parking, less glass, less petrochemicals, no petrochemicals. Fewer layers, less demolition, no demolition. It should be no everything. Less metal, certainly less floor area per person. Be less extractive, be less submissive, and have less weight. And thank you very much. <laughs>